Hey, 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 how y'all doing, man? This is Mongo Slate. And today we're going to talk about John Moxley. Uh, and, well, the the article title is going to be called John Moxley Comments on Wrestlers That Call Fans Marks. So first, uh, hit the like button for me. Hit subscribe. Thank you. And if you could please give me $1, uh, that would, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, so $1 is all I need to continue doing the channel. <laughs> One dollar per person listening. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to read this uh, transcript. It's from an interview that John Moxley did in the lead up to AEW's Full Gear. It was it was with SportingNews.com, but I'm not going to click SportingNews.com because I'm not familiar with that site. So I'll just uh, look at the excerpts here from No DQ. I'm going to read where they talk about fans, and then we're going to see uh, we're going to we're going to analyze this a little bit. So John Moxley says, to me, wrestling in 2020, the fans are smarter and more educated. I don't like when I'm on the, when I'm in the locker room and some guys going, oh, the marks on Twitter are saying this bunch of stupid marks or whatever and treating fans like they're idiots. That pisses me off. The old school wrestling mentality was that this is a, a work and we're carnies and we're trying to cheat people out of their money. We're trying to present this thing, tricking them into thinking it's real and taking their money from them. That's the origin of carny wrestling a century ago. That's not what it is today. Wrestling fans, to me, are the most passionate, educated, some of the smartest fans in the world. And they really appreciate not only the effort, they appreciate the passion of the wrestlers for their craft. They appreciate the effort. They appreciate how we're putting our bodies on the line. And then he talks about how AEW fans are paying attention to details and all that type of stuff. He said, I think we have some of the sharpest, most studious fans in the game. It actually pushes us up to where we have to put on better stories and more authentic stories and add more detail. It's a much more discerning audience than it's ever been before. And then, he, of course, he has a little dig at WWE at the end, but I'm not going to go into that because it's going to take me off into something completely different. So let's talk about the, the origins of Carney wrestling that he's talking about here. Um, he's not wrong. OK, he's he's not wrong. The idea, the the concept of Marx came from, uh, oh, what, what book was I reading? I think it might have been pretty much every goddamn, well, <laughs> every book that knows that wrestling is a work have pretty much talked about the days of barnstorming. Barnstorming is where they used to do, where they used to do the traveling circus, where, you know, the wrestlers would go and they would say, if you can pin anybody, if you pin this wrestler, you'll win $5 or something like that. You would have to go into a new town and wrestle guys for money and you know but of course you would you know some of your challengers would be people that you know so you would beat them really easily to show that you could or you would let them win showing that you you're beatable and you know then they'll pay to wrestle you and you'll beat them you know that was kind of how barnstorming worked you would go from town to town either wrestling the the local wrestling guy or tricking the audience to thinking that you're either a unbeatable or B completely beatable. And therefore they'll give you money to either a beat you or B try to beat you, but you really beat them. Cause you're not. So it's like being a pool shark in a way, like a pool shark sometimes pretends to be a worse player than they really are. Sometimes the wrestler will, will pretend to not be as good as he, you know, as, as he really is. And that would go into, you know, wrestlers will also uh, lie about their identities and stuff like that. People who have, legit wrestling backgrounds to go into another territory with a different name. And, um, this was in the, this was in the 1900s, the 1910s, the 1920s. So we're not talking about the fifties here. We're talking about, you know, in the early, early days of wrestling, you know, that's back when barnstorming really first started, you know, it was, a, it was basically with the tribal and circus. So he's not wrong that the concept of marking or, you know, getting people to believe that what you're doing is legit when really it's worked, that is where it comes from. Um, but that mentality, even though there have been a lot of exposés on wrestling and stuff like that, that mentality didn't really go anywhere. It's, it, it continued all the way up until 1989 or 1990, whatever year that was when Vincent Mann basically told the state of New Jersey, this shit is not real. There were exposés and stuff in the thirties and forties and fifties and sixties and seventies because people were mad at the NWA and we're going to the cops and telling the cops, oh, yeah, this shit is fixed. It's fake. The NWA is fake. 
because they were putting promoters out of business and all that type of stuff. So there was a lot of exposés, but you really had to be a lawyer or a sports reporter to be able to, to, to know about it. You know, you had to really be in the know to know that, you know, wrestling was fixed and worked and stuff like that. It wasn't, to, you know, Vince McMahon was, of course, the first major uh, promoter to come out and say that it was a work. But I think other wrestlers have come out and said they were, it were works, too, because they got put under oath. You know, like um, there was people who had been, you know, under oath and lawsuits and stuff like that. They had to admit that it was a work. And some people who were even under oath, they lied and said that it wasn't a work. <laughs> but he's not wrong. That's where the concept of Marx coming from is, you know, people are, are intentionally lying, intentionally misleading the audience. So he's saying like wrestling, you know, so he's basically saying wrestling fans can't be Marx anymore because they're, we're not intentionally lying to them anymore. And that's a, that's a good argument to make, you know, it's like, well, they're not really Marks anymore because they know what they're getting now. So they're basically just fans of the product, you know, and they're very smart about the product. Now they're smarter than they used to be. A lot of them can see the strings and the illusion. So they, I mean, so many people talk so much now that you do see a lot of the strings in the illusion. So I get it, you know, and he talks about, you know, um, now he basically was talking about AEW fans a little bit later, but he said wrestling fans to me are the most passionate, educated, some of the smartest fans in the world. That's true because a lot of wrestling fans, it's, wrestling is a niche uh, niche product. You know, it's something that very few people are interested in. It's like theater. You know, theater, it makes a lot of money, but very, very few people are interested in theater. But so people, but there are people who are, you know, I look at it like I always look at wrestling through this analogy that Raven gave me. It was, it's a beautiful analogy. And that's how you know that um, I'm one of these people that he's talking about is that Raven did a, uh, he gave, I forget what kind of article it was. That he not, not article I read, but it was like a interview that he had done where he basically did like a, a, a triangle, you know, where he talked about at the bottom are all of the, like, you know, like a triangle, right? It's at the bottom, at the base level, are all the people who watch wrestling. And at the next, it's the next level is a smaller chunk of people. They're the people who talk about wrestling online or write letters to promoters and stuff like that. And then an even smaller chunk of them, you know, talk about it, you know, as far as engaging, you know, want to know, wanting to know more information about it. And then at the tippy top, at the peak, are the people who want to know everything. You know, you're that's a very, very small part of the uh, wrestling business. And that's that remains the same today. Is that, you know, the people like me, um, people like Meltzer, people like Alvarez, we are at the peak of this pyramid of wrestling fans that look, that read wrestling websites that um, make wrestling content. We talk to other wrestling fans. We debate other wrestling fans. Most people don't do that. Most people don't go through all the trouble of, you know, critiquing a wrestling match. They just watch what they see. They like it. They clap like seals and they move on. You know, if they don't like it, they go, eh, and they move on. You know, most, the most people, like when people say, um, cancel WWE network, most people, or quietly will quietly walk away more so than make a big deal and stomp and, and talk about how this is why people don't watch TV anymore. This is why people don't watch this shit anymore. Like very few people do that. Very few people. And it may seem like a lot of people because you can go on a lot of different websites and hear that kind of stuff, but that's a small, small, small percentage of the audience. What you think is stupid. Other people love. And you know, I always have to be mindful of that. Like, I hate certain things. I really do. I hate certain characters. I really do. You know, some people hate that I call them characters. I've had people on Twitter say, why do you call him a character? He's a person. It's the same thing. Like, especially when I had that Andrew Yang conversation. And people were like, uh, when Andrew Yang said, oh, if that person doesn't exist, the character doesn't exist. I'm like, that's not true. <laughs> you could always recast Undertaker. WWE owns the character of the Undertaker. It's all about whether the audience would accept somebody else as that character, which they wouldn't. You know, it's like uh, in the movies where sometimes a movie flops because the fans don't accept this person as Batman, like uh, Val Kilmer. Like anybody can play Batman. Warner Brothers owns the concept of Batman. You know, they can literally put anybody in the suit that they want. 
But the audience who are fans of Batman are going to look and be like, nah, I ain't about to go watch no Val Kilmer Batman. Get the hell out of here with that. You know, like, and WWE is the same way. They did it with Razor and Diesel. <laughs> you know, they did it with Undertaker before. They did it with Kane. They did multiple Kanes, multiple Sin Caras. They have shown you that they can take characters and put other people in the gimmick. And they will do it. But the fans won't accept it, you know? Like they just will just they'll just poo poo it like Ugh, I don't want I don't want no second rate Sankara I don't want no second rate Kane, you know like the fake Kane is a whole that's a whole different deal. So those people are the people who who would know who would even notice that it's a completely different person. Like a lot of people don't know that Matt Bourne was not you know Doink the Clown in the later years, right? Like in some of the later incarnations of Doink the Clown. Matt Bourne wasn't even doing very few people know that because WWE just replaced the guy in the costume. But a lot of people don't get that. You have to be in, in, in the peak of wrestling to even think that the person portraying the character can be somebody else. Okay. So, you know, so it, it happens, but, uh, I lost my track, but yeah. So yes, a lot of wrestling fans, especially people at the peak in the, in the upper peaks of the, of the wrestling scale, they are very, very interested in, in, in being very smart and are paying attention to details. But I think that also people are doing a lot of cross referencing when it comes to wrestling, because everybody comes from to wrestling to from some, from a different background, you know, like my background is in uh, politics and, uh, criminal justice and stuff like that. So I can, I'm perfectly okay looking at, you know, uh, not just wrestling, but looking at the stories behind it, you know, the, the different things that go into it. I'm also a writer. So I'm always looking at how stories are being crafted, how the characters are being put together. Um, whether the story makes sense, whether the characters motivations, what are their desires? What do they want? What do they need? Et cetera, et cetera. It's like, just like if you was to watch a movie, you want to know what the characters in the movie want. How are you going to string these characters? Like, how are you going to resolve the story, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's, that's the background that I come from. And some people come from a theater background. You know, it's like some wrestlers, like there's a guy recently who came to WWE. He worked at Cirque du Soleil. You know, you have other people who are models, some who people who are gymnasts, some people who are football players. Like all of these people, and it's the same with wrestling fans. You have wrestling fans that are into comic books. So they draw and write comics. You have people who are into theater. So they're into live entertainment. They don't want to be in the building and see. Like you had, what was that kid's name? He did, uh, he, he got, he got me too. What's his name? Max something. Max or something like that. Uh, he was a writer. He was a screenwriter. He screen wrote movies. Uh, Max, 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 something or other. But uh, he looked at it from a he looked at wrestling from a from a film perspective, you know. He he it was a lot of different people who who bring different things. There's analytical people, people who bring in graphs and uh, math and all that type of stuff into wrestling, and it makes it a more fun space to be in. Even though sometimes people have blinders on, you know. But yes, I, I can completely agree with what he's saying that there are. A lot of fans in this business that are really, really smart, that are really attention, paying attention to the details far more than they used to be in the past, you know, far more than it used to be in the past. But that didn't mean that those people didn't exist in the past. Does that mean that they were drowned out in the past because there was a sea of other people, you know, like we've created this conclave of fans where, you know, we see each other on Cornette's podcast or we see each other on Conan's part of that podcast or in what culture videos or in solid monster videos, you may see some of the same people commenting in those comment sections, you know, no matter the size of the channel, you may see more, you may see some, a lot of the same people commenting in those places. That's because you were in, you're in a bubble, <laughs> you know, you're in a bubble. You go to a WWE channel, you know, and you see people who are literally still taking it real. They, they still think it's real. Like I looked up, for the purpose of a video, I looked up Charlotte um, disowning Ric Flair. This was in 2016, 2017, something like that. And people, there were people in the comment section that thought it was real. Believe it or not, yes, there are still people who think it's real. They just sit back and enjoy it. 
You know, they're not like us. They're not cynical, jaded, uh, overly critical, overly analytical. They're not in the upper echelon in the top, in the peak of the wrestling pyramid. They're not, they don't want to be in there. They want to be a casual fan. They want to be able to look at, you know, what they see on, on the screen, absorb it. And if they like it, keep watching. If they don't like it, quietly walk away, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. So he's not wrong here. You know, wrestling fans are more analytical and more detailed than they used to be because wrestling is a very niche product. Um, the, the old days was about, you know, making things look real and uh, leading people to believe that what they're doing is real. Now everybody knows that it's not real. Um, but it, that kind of would, uh, <laughs> you should probably ask the question of why he does barbed wire stuff, like why the barbed wire has to be real, why the thumbtacks have to be real. You know, <laughs> that, he, that he plays around with. But, you know, that's just kind of how it is. But I understand his 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 position. You know, now he, what he said about AEW fans in particular, I'm not I'm going to avoid because I don't want to get into a whole AEW versus WWE thing. I just don't see it as being uh, helpful in this situation. But um, he he's not wrong. You're not tricking people anymore. You know, you're not tricking people into paying money for a show that you think is real anymore you're paying you're getting people to pay into your theater um you know your theater troupe which is essentially what it is now and guess what i am i'm 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 okay with that everybody is allowed to look at this shit as any way they want it's it's an artistic experiment it is a theatric experiment it is you know it like i said man you you have wrestlers that are approaching it from a lot of different ways too this is where you get wrestlers who are playing like the guitars, playing guitar, you know, trying to trying to do music, trying to do art, trying to do theater, trying to do gymnastics. They're, you know, it's everybody. You know, everybody is trying to do it their own way. That's part of the benefit of it being a, a group of independent contractors is that nobody can tell you how there's one way to do it. You know, there's a hundred different ways of doing it, you know, and everybody does it different, you know, and even... Even in places where it's supposed to be serious, you still have joke, joke guys like Dan Housen is in fucking Ring of Honor now, you know, like he's a fucking comedy character, you know, and Ring of Honor is supposed to be like dead serious wrestling. You have shit like Delirious going on, just like in WWE, where you have this guy disappearing and reappearing, and then you've got, you know, Drew Gulak arresting you to death or uh, Timothy Thatcher doing Thatcher Stash Can skits. You know, like you have, you know, it's a smorgasbord now. It's like not, you know, you go into a, 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 and go into the meat and it's all, you know, apple cinnamon donuts. Now you got apple cinnamon donuts. You got powdered donuts. You got, you know, chocolate donuts. You got jelly filled donuts. You got something for everybody. And yeah, people are going to be like, yeah, jelly filled donuts. Yeah. You know, but if that's what you got to sit through in order to get to what you really want, I mean, now you don't even really have to do that because you can just watch what you like on YouTube and that's it. <laughs> you know, like you don't have to sit through Santino Morella or uh, you know, Luchasaurus if you don't want to. You can fast forward through it on your VCR or whatever, your your, uh, your DVR. You know, like, um, so I, 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 I 100% agree with John Moxley.